Hey guys, I want to say a big thank you to my guest, Jay Nightmares, for joining me on this episode. I hope you're ready for this. On June 3rd, 2016, I had a social media event. I was an Instagram influencer, and the event was a golf tournament. I posted on social to ask followers to come. So when he showed up, it didn't surprise me. Sure, the tickets were $250. But for some reason, that didn't click with me. It was a drinking event as well, and he showed up at least tipsy, but having a good time. He was also an Instagram model who I knew online. He asked me out on a date for after the tournament. I was a single mom, and because of the event, my parents were watching my kid until the next day. I said sure. We went off on the date went to a bar and grabbed food. The man was handsome, but mostly charming as hell. We had a beer, and then in his car, he offered some weed. I rarely smoke, but decided what the hell. We hotboxed, then went off to a bar. He was friendly with everyone and made me laugh quite a few times. Then off to the liquor store for more alcohol, and finally to his house. I was drunk and high, so it was easy to sleep with me. He had a bunk bed, and I remember him being on the top, and being very selfish and aggressive, and me being scared. I didn't stop him out of fear. He had driven, and my car was still at the golf tournament location, and we were too far for me to afford an Uber back to my car. The next morning, I went to the restroom, and afterward noticed a long pipe coming from the toilet after I flushed. He came out upset because it was to water the weed him and his roommate were growing. I didn't know. I was still too drunk and high for it to click. I apologized deeply and was scared. We came downstairs and I looked at the walls and decor for the first time. Knives and weapons were used as decorations all over the house. I waited for him to have breakfast and drive me back to my car, trying not to show panic. In the car, I knew I needed an excuse that wouldn't hurt his feelings. I told him I had a blast and was bummed because I really like him, but my child's father passed away when he was one, and I can't have CPS take him away because I'm around someone growing weed. I told him I didn't care about the weed and didn't want him to change, so it was a bummer. I let him make out with me one last time as he dropped me off. I was shaking as I drove off because of the vibes. The very next day, after he dropped me off, he met a girl that was 10 years our junior, and she was an 18-year-old mini-me. He dated her for three weeks, she dumped him, and he stalked her like crazy, so much so that he was arrested a few times. In September of the same year, he gets out of jail the last time and heads to a bar, meets a girl there, and takes her home. He ends up murdering her, chopping up her body, cutting her heart out, and setting it on fire. He's currently serving life for his crime, and I get flashbacks all the time. For a bit of backstory, I was working at a small chain motel in the Midwest as a night auditor. My hours were normally 11pm to 8am. With those kinds of hours and being a woman, I'm bound to have some weird stories. The scariest time I've ever had working there happened within my first month. So, it was a little before my shift started, and because I was single and 22, I was on Tinder before work. I match with this guy who seems cool, a little goth and alternative, and into Ouija boards and tarot, which is my type, so I was hyped at the time. We talk for a bit, and I tell him I have to go to work. We say goodbye. Now, that night was my first night off training, so I was running the motel by myself for nine hours. I was already a little nervous. But then, this vaguely familiar guy comes up to the front desk and asks for me by name. In my head, I've got red flags blaring at me, 
because this guy is weird. Not by looks, but just by the vibe. I tell him yes, that's me, and he explained that he was the guy from Tinder, and he saw that I was less than a mile away, so he went out to see if I was possibly working at this hotel. That's right, this guy was staying where I worked. Red flag number two. I stay behind the comfort of my desk for two hours because this guy won't stop talking to me. Mostly about how his ex left him and how he beat people up and how he wanted to bang me. Needless to say, I was uncomfortable and this hadn't happened to me before in a work environment. So I did not know what to do. He finally decided to go to bed at 2 to 3 in the morning and I take a much needed smoke break. I go outside, and right after I spark up, guess who shows up? The creepy guy. I snooped a bit on his account. He was a painter and was doing work locally, so he wasn't from here. He tells me about where he's from, and keeps getting closer and closer to me. He asks me if he can smoke weed, which I said yes so he'd get away from me. I showed him where the cameras weren't and he pulled me in, smelled my neck, and started to grab my ass. I swiftly hit him and told him he better not touch me again. I threw my cigarettes on the ground and grabbed my phone to call my boss before going inside. The creepy guy rips the phone from my hand and proceeds to text himself. Now he had my number. First thing he sends me is a grotesque picture of his extremely body modded nether region. I've seen some of those in my day, but that was like nothing I'd ever seen. Then came the creepy BDSM adult images with captions like, I can't wait to do this to you. You know what room I'm in. Now I'm already freaking out and I don't know why I didn't call the cops. And my boss wasn't answering. So there's me in the back office having the panic attack of my life when I get one more video. Why I clicked on it, I'll never know. I refuse to say what I saw in detail, but it was a snuff adult video. Very violent, very sexual. I then locked myself in the back room, cried, and waited a few hours before proceeding to make hotel breakfast. The text went on for a few days until I'd had enough. I got the balls to tell my boss. He immediately kicked out the creepy guy and banned him from our hotel. His company is not even allowed to book with that hotel anymore. In hindsight, I should have called the police, but I was too scared. I'm so mentally and emotionally drained from this whole situation. Some more important things to know before I get into it. I'm a 24-year-old trans guy who's a homosexual and aromantic, and even though I don't flaunt my sexuality, I don't exactly hide it either. I've made a couple of posts on Facebook stating this, so I don't know how she didn't know. She herself is a 23-year-old woman and I've known her for almost two years. Anyway, this takes place the day after Valentine's Day, and I'm getting off work at about 3.30ish, when Tiffany asks me if I wanted to get dinner with her at a specific steakhouse that I really like. So I join her at the restaurant, thinking we were just hanging out because I had no reason to believe that a lady I was friends with for two years would want to date an obviously gay man. I ordered chicken strips and water, and she ordered a lot of food. Like a lot. During the whole meal, she tried to share her food with me, and I kept refusing because I just wanted chicken strips. We discussed a few topics and some weird ones. The weird ones were asking about past relationships and experiences with others. I vaguely mentioned that I haven't dated in a few years and usually just end up getting my needs met with a stranger. I kept it vague as we were in a restaurant, and even though I'm open about my experiences with friends, I don't think that sharing explicit details in a public setting is appropriate. 
I honestly kind of felt uncomfortable as she tried to pry me for details, but I just told her that I didn't feel like this was a good place to talk about stuff like that. She eventually dropped it. Once we finish, I went to pull out my card to pay for my meal, and she stopped me, saying that she'd pay for it, and I asked if she was sure. She insisted, so I let her pay because my meal was really cheap. The bill total ended up being almost $100. Like I said, she got a lot of food. I thanked her for the meal and I Ubered home. About 2am on the 16th, two hours before I had to get up for work, I was woken up by a lot of Facebook messages from Tiffany, calling me all sorts of names and other crazy messages from her. I responded half dead with, What? And as soon as I sent a few messages asking what she was talking about, she called me on Facebook Messenger and I answered, still half asleep. She immediately started screaming at me, saying, I paid for your meal. I can't believe you. You let me on. I spent a lot of money on that meal. The least you could do was hook up with me. And some other crazy scream that I was unable to understand because screaming at a half-asleep person through a phone doesn't come out as clear as you think. I ended up hanging up because I needed sleep, and maybe she was drunk or had messaged me by mistake, so I fell back asleep. Guys, I honestly thought that I'd never seen a grown woman go so batshit crazy. When I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, I was gifted with a wonderful wall of notifications of 87 Facebook messages and 17 missed Facebook calls. Thank goodness this girl didn't have my actual number. While I was getting ready and waiting to clock in at 6.30am, I read them all, and the amount of horrible and disgusting things this girl had sent was just baffling. She called me everything from homophobic slurs, sexist comments, calling me a dirty half-breed who should have died in the womb along with your mom. I'm of Mexican and Spanish descent, so I think she was referring to that. She said some other extremely disgusting shit. She also demanded I pay her a hundred dollars for the trouble. After reading all that, I clocked in for my eight-hour shift, immediately regretting reading all of that before. And after getting off, I get home to more horrible messages. I sit down in a Discord call with friends, and I end up dumping the whole thing on them because I was stressed out and extremely cranky. And during that call, I'm thinking about how to go about this when a wonderful idea pops into my head. I should send some screenshots of these to her parents. So I pick through all the messages, making sure to get the best ones to send and send them to her mom and dad. A little bit about her parents, her parents are the sweetest and kindest people I've met. The mom is a sweet southern Christian woman who's the type to bake cookies for the new neighbors and is very loving in the love thy neighbor no matter what. She knew I was gay and trans, but her daughter didn't until later. And her dad is the upfront and clear and take no shit kind of person. The way he talks is kind of annoying, but I like it because he tells you exactly what he thinks. Anyways, her mom messages me a bit later saying, I'm so sorry about this. I had no idea. I can't believe she would say or do something like this. This isn't how we raised her. I hope you don't think we think the same about you. After about 10 or so minutes after, Tiffany messages me back saying, Did you just message my mom? And I didn't answer. Some time passes and her dad messages me, apologizing for his daughter's words and acts, and then goes on to say that they've kicked her out of their house, taken away permission to drive their car, refused to pay any more of her college expenses, and her brothers have cut contact with her, one of which is married to a Mexican woman. So you can imagine how he took the half-breed comment she made. After that, it was silence. No messages, no calls, no nothing. Until today, I get on and went to go look at Facebook and notice her Facebook is gone. She's completely deleted it, so it's over.
I'm not afraid of her finding me, because she doesn't know where I live or work. She doesn't know any of my contact information other than Facebook. This whole situation has been unnecessarily stressful and just terrible. I did ask her parents if they were okay with me talking about it publicly, and luckily they were okay with it. I met my ex in February of 2020, but didn't end up dating him till closer to my 17th birthday because he still lived with his girlfriend and I didn't find out till later that they were actually still doing things together and meeting him was the biggest mistake of my life. Everything started off great as every relationship goes. I sent pictures because he was my boyfriend, so you know, and of course I let him save them for later. Another big mistake. I noticed that they were still texting, and when I went through his phone, he was still saying he loved her and missed her. I was deeply hurt and called him out on it. He apologized and said it would never happen again, and I told him to text her that we were dating. And he did. She was pissed. She stopped paying for the house and helping him with car payments, and at this time he quit Taco Bell and refused to do his new job Ubering because, and I quote, I need to practice League of Legends because I want to be a pro league streamer. So I worked my ass off and ended up losing my job because the manager didn't let me work without a doctor's note. So I was stuck working his job while he played his games. Before I met him, I had four and a half thousand dollars in my savings. He ended up using my card to pay his phone bills, car payments, the apartment, daily weed, fast food, new league accounts, and also CSGO knives. He kept losing his accounts due to telling people to off themselves and constant swearing and racial slurs. But the worst was yet to happen. I found that he was using an old tablet to excessively watch adult entertainment set up dating accounts and have different Instagram accounts, but on these accounts he was pretending to be a woman. I called him out about this and told him I wanted to leave. He freaks out, jumping around and screaming and crying, saying he would change, and I trusted him. As time went on, things got worse, and I was scared to leave, and by the end of this you'll see why. He'd shoved me into a wall and got in my face, screaming, You stole my car key because you don't want me to work, because you're jealous of other girls. Which was stupid, because he'd thrown his car keys at me during a different argument. But one day, I went through the iPad and found that he was actively not just sending, but selling my pictures from when I was 16 to 17, and doing the same with his other ex. I started to try to get my stuff together and put Gorilla Glue in the charging port to just get rid of the filth I saw. When he found out that it no longer charged after he used my card to get us food, he was livid. He started screaming and getting in my face. I tried to go around him and grab my things, but when my back was turned, he pulled me down to the ground, wrestled me till he was able to put me in a chokehold. I was sobbing and just accepted that this would be the end, but before I blacked out, he let me go when I started gasping for air and gagging from excessive coughing as he just stood there and laughed at me. I tried to crawl away from him, and then he grabbed my leg and started dragging me out of the apartment. I kicked to try to get him off me, which just made him pull me like a dog playing tug of war. He eventually dragged me out, keeping my wallet, keys, and all of my valuables, so I sat crying, begging for my stuff so I could just go home. He came outside and pulled me down the apartment stairs by my leg. I was left with extreme bruising and some cuts. I did end up calling the police, and they did absolutely nothing. Fast forward. He had to move because he had nowhere to stay or live after getting evicted from the apartment, and I had gotten a new job. One day it was particularly cold, and I went to get a shirt out of my car. 
And there he was. He was sitting in my car on his phone. I left the door unlocked usually because I worked in a good area. I called him a cheater and told him to leave. He got out of the car and was starting to go around the back, so I jumped in and tried to lock the door from the back seat. He ran over and pulled the door open and started trying to pull me out of the car. I started screaming and kicking at him. Thankfully, a customer saw this happening and called the police. They arrested him and told me to go home for the night, which they ended up firing me for. Unfortunately, he got bailed out, and while he was in jail, he'd given out my phone number to other people there. He walked four and a half hours to my house after he was released, and he was looking around my backyard when my neighbor saw him and called my dad. My dad got in his truck with a gun and waited for him to come out of the gas station. He eventually did, but ran off. He wasn't shot. He had harassed me by saying that he was going to show up to my graduation and ruin everything. And he's gotten to the point of making multiple fake accounts on Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok, pretending to be me and his other exes. And as of the 1st of January, 2023, he still pretends to be high school girls, selling our pictures and making fake accounts. We've all had bad dates, right? This is the only date I've had to date that rang every alarm bell and waved every red flag. I'll start this by saying I don't go on many dates, but when I do, I make sure I follow safety protocol by only meeting my date in public spaces. I let either family or friends know where I'm going, and I park in a populated place close by to wherever we meet. Anyway, this date initially suggested we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks. I said no, I don't feel comfortable with that. I only want to meet in public. He seemed okay with this, but then brought it up a few more times and said if money was an issue, we could meet up another time or forget about it altogether. But my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose. Anyway, he turns up in a two-door car and goes into the cafe and I follow behind and introduce myself. After a polite introduction, things begin to get a bit weird. I order a Coke and he says, Don't you want a drink? I was going to pop into a bar and get one. I say no, I'm not drinking, and he looks at me confused, as if I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again pissed me off. He seemed to disappear and goes to order a cider from the bar while I get a table. Anyway, we sit down with our drinks and the date immediately goes on about going back to his place, even though the original plan was to stay here and order food, and I already stated that was not happening. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and eating in his place, and I said we don't have to eat, we can just have drinks and leave. He gets defensive and says he has money, but prefers it if we go back to his place. I make a joke and say, You're not a killer, are you? And instead of laughing it off, he stares at me uncannily and says, You don't think I would hurt you, do you? I laugh uncomfortably and say of course not, but really I'm relieved this date won't be going any further. My date suddenly says, are you going to follow me in your car? Because that wouldn't make much sense. How about we go into my car? But I've got packages in the front, so you'll have to squeeze in the back, and I'll drop you off back to your car after. In reality, that made less sense than me following in my car and driving home from his house. The fact it was completely illogical made it even more creepy in my mind. Every alarm bell was going off at this point. I said, look, I don't want to go to yours, and your insistence is giving me the creeps. My date looks shocked, mumbles something about needing the toilet, and excuses himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window getting into his car and driving off. 
massive bullet dodged in my opinion. Also, the fact his car didn't have back doors made it even more sinister. Because imagine if something happened in the car and I couldn't escape. This was in April 2021. For a bit of background, my name is Janelle. I'm a 21-year-old French girl. I'm a student in Lille. I was tired that I was not finding true love, so I decided to have my first time with my best friend. Then I find a fantastic sex friend, which I get along with wonderfully on all levels. We were together for about three months. They then sound the time to throw me away because I still love my ex. I was very fragile that I make my first attempt to end it all. I end up being taken to emergency and then the mental hospital. For those of you that have already deduced, you'll understand that I was already in a depressive state for a few months with a strong punch shot for alcohol. To complete this auto-destructive mechanism, what better than dating apps? A few weeks after my release from the mental hospital, I match up to make new encounters and especially forget my dear and tender sex friend. I always meet the guys at home for a first date because I have zero experience and that's what I did for my very first date. One fine day comes when I matched with a guy, Matthew. Matthew is not very beautiful and has a few extra pounds but I'm no Beyonce either, so I match. We laugh a little, we have some common tastes, and especially he smokes weed, so I thought, it's perfect, we'll smoke some joints between us. He gives me some personal information, like his address, and his job, or rather old job. He'd just gotten fired. Work or no work, I don't care. I don't want to share my life with him anyway. I explain to him that I'm fragile and that I've come out of a mental clinic, that I'm depressed and blah blah blah. It was all for the sole purpose of making him understand that he can't play with me. I also tell him that I'm solely looking for sex, but still with some discussion, complicity, hugs, and other things of that nature. I explain that I'm not just a shot in 20 minutes and it's done. He assures me that that's what he's looking for too and that he's actually very cuddly. Perfect. After only one or two days of talking, we agree on a date. Mojito party at my house, and he brings some joints. And here's how the meeting went. Machu arrives. He's really not cute. Even worse than in the photos. He has a dirty look, like greasy hair, a stained t-shirt, the style of a grungy teenager despite him being 26 years old. In short, I mean far from wetting my panties, but I desperately need company. I offer for him to make the drinks while I chose a film on television. He goes into the kitchen and prepares to make two mojitos before joining me on the sofa. We talk a bit. He's not very smart or very interesting. I drown in my drink, hoping to animate the party alone and this is the start of a three-day blackout. According to our dear Matthew, we would have then drunk and smoked while watching a film before going into the bedroom. I vaguely remember being naked on my bed and seeing him dressed above me, looking at me before turning his heels and slamming the door. My phone is dead. My alarm clock is not ringing. I'm away from a work group appointment, so my friends are worried and call me. They can't contact me, so they contact my sister, but when she tries to get a hold of me, it goes straight to voicemail. The girls come down to my place and ring and ring again, but still no answer. They call the fire service, who manage to get the entry door open, but not the door to my apartment. They knock on the door, calling me, and I end up opening the door, dressed in a blanket to hide my nakedness. I look at them, confused. The firemen conclude that I'm hungover, and they leave while my friends help me get dressed. They also think I drank too much. They notice my body is covered with yellow betadine on my arms, legs, and stomach. I told them that I burned my arm yesterday, 
and that I treated myself, but there were no signs of a burn or anything on my arm. Besides, I don't even own Betadine. My friends take my cat, and I end up at one of their houses, being as I'm in a comatose state. I have trouble speaking. I look completely elsewhere. I even have trouble thinking. The next day my sister comes to pick me up so I can stay with her for a few days. Everyone is convinced I try to end myself again with drugs and alcohol. I start complaining about pain in my intimate area and blood loss, so my sister decides to take me to the hospital. I tell them that I might want to make a report since I was unconscious and it may have been unprotected. I get so many tests. I'm advised to file a complaint and I'm being redirected to the OB emergency. The next day, I finally regain consciousness gently. My relatives see it right away. I'm a little more lively and more coherent. I end up getting more swabs done and I get preventative AIDS treatment. Over the course of a week, I made a series of appointments for blood samples, urine samples, and that stuff. I went to file a complaint with the testimony of my friends who met me at my home and my sister who took care of me. After talking about it to people my age, older people, but especially medical staff and the police, the term organ trafficking was more than mentioned. They think the guy chickened out at the last minute. Despite my complaint, my bed full of betadine, my underwear torn off, and the blood on the doors of the apartment, my attacker got nothing. I will never know what really happened and what he really wanted. I would like to point out that I used to drink and smoke in addition to my treatment, and that never before have I had a blackout of three days. I'm pretty sure he put something in my drink. It's good to talk about it anyway. Thank you. For a little bit of background, I'm in a wonderful relationship now with a guy I met on Tinder, so this is in no way, shape, or form me shitting on the app. I'm currently a senior at a four-year university, but this happened in my sophomore year when I was 19. For me, it was pretty hard to find someone to just casually date and get to know, since I'm a bit of an introverted individual and wasn't looking for any old hump and dump. I also went through my fair share of abusive relationships, so dating for me was really difficult when it came to opening up and trusting people. When I matched with Chris, I was pleasantly surprised. He was a funny, smart, interesting college student with a decent job and good intentions. I enjoyed talking to him, but there was a lot of anxiety when I spoke with him. I know now that I should have trusted my gut instinct, but at the time, I assumed I was doing my introverted trust issues bullshit and tried to push that feeling away. We would talk a few times a week, and every time we did, the feeling would persist. Only each time we talked, it would be stronger. He started to make comments about how he wanted me to be his girlfriend and how he was so excited for me to meet his parents. But we hadn't met, and it only talked on and off for a few weeks at this point. So, slowly, I stopped responding to some of his messages, then I started to leave them completely unanswered. One day, I confided in my friends and told them about the bad feeling I always had while talking with Chris. They told me that I wasn't being open to new experiences because I hadn't let go of my past and that I wasn't being fair to him. So, reluctantly, after a few weeks of radio silence and feeling guilty, I messaged him again. Another week or two of messaging and catching up, he asked me to go out to dinner with him. I was hesitant to say yes, as my anxiety was through the roof, but my friends insisted that it was just nerves and it would be good for me to go out with someone. I agreed, and he excitedly told me he had plans to take me to a nice Japanese restaurant in the city next to my campus. My friends were ecstatic and asked to see a picture of him. I pulled up his Tinder profile 
and when they swiped through the pictures, they were silent. You know, he, uh, he kind of looks like Jacob. Jacob was a particularly abusive ex. I went into a full-blown panic attack. Once I saw the resemblance, there was no going back. There was no way I was going anywhere with this guy. I texted him back the night before the date and explained that I no longer felt comfortable going out and that I was sorry. He never texted me back. That same week, I started getting multiple phone calls every day from an unknown number. They would leave me voicemails that would say things like, Call me back, babe. Or, Baby, where are you? Why won't you give me a chance? I tried ignoring them, but one day, after getting almost ten calls, I answered, ready to curse someone the fuck out. I called Chris by his name and told him where to go and was met with laughter. This isn't Chris. This is Jeff. Who? Chris said I could have you. <laughs> he started laughing, so I hung up and he immediately called me back. I sent him to voicemail. He said you wanted to go out with me instead. He told me what university you go to and showed me your pictures. I'll wait on campus if I have to. I blocked his number and for a few more days I got a few more unknown calls and voicemails detailing some pretty weird, aggressive, and gross stuff, but they eventually died down. I don't know if this guy was serious, or maybe it was Chris getting his friend to mess with me as revenge for cancelling, but whatever it was, it had me looking behind myself any time I walked anywhere on campus for the rest of the semester. My roommates and I had a male friend stay with us for a while, just in case. I started going back to my hometown on the weekends because I was afraid to stay on campus for too long. It's been two years, so I hope that in this amount of time, Chris and Jeff have learned to become better people. Or that someone kicked their asses already. So this happened about 10 years ago when I was in college. I am a female and I was a sophomore at about 19 to 20 years old, and I was horribly naive. The college I went to was a religious school and had several rules that students had to follow. The rules important to the story are no drinking on campus. You could only visit the opposite sex in their room during visitation hours, and during visitation, the door had to be left open. I was not an unattractive girl, and I happened to draw the attention of a guy who shared the same major as I did. This means we had a bunch of classes together. He introduced himself to me as Andy, and we began talking. He was very tall, about six foot four, and quite heavy. At one point, he weighed about 300 pounds. He expressed romantic interest in me, but I wasn't attracted to him and told him this whenever he brought it up. He would immediately backtrack and say how happy he was being my friend, and he didn't mind that I didn't care about him romantically. I did get along very well with him though, and we hung out just the two of us frequently. The other people in our class began to expect to see us together, and we became fast friends. Andy had a girlfriend when we met who attended another school. He broke up with her during the summer break between freshman and sophomore year, but unbeknownst to me, the reason for the breakup was that he wanted to start pursuing me more actively. When I came back from summer break, something had changed. Andy became more forwards towards me, often making comments about how pretty I was and that I should be with him. I began to become uncomfortable with the attention and told him so many times. I unfortunately didn't want to lose him as a friend, since he was one of only a few friends I hung out with. A lot of those friends I met through him, so if I had to cut him off, I would have close to no one to talk to. Andy would often swing wildly from charming and sweet to insulting and manipulative, 
He would offer to take me places and help me with things, then would say that I owed him something in return for those things. He would say we were so close and we should just date, since we were already practically together all the time. Alcohol made it worse. I tried to avoid drinking with him, but it did happen occasionally, either off campus or sneakily while in his dorm room. He sometimes used my past relationships to manipulate me into feeling guilty. As a religious person, I had committed a cardinal sin by sleeping with the two guys I'd previously dated before meeting Andy. He brought this up a lot, implying that I was damaged goods because of this. He at one point told me, I'm the best man that you could possibly get because of your past. Eventually, I caved and told him I'd date him just to see if there were any feelings there whatsoever. This, of course, made him ecstatic, but it also made him extremely overprotective of me and jealous of any attention I received from anyone of the opposite sex. He would call and text me constantly, and if I didn't pick up the first time, he would call me until I did. He constantly questioned where I was going to be and would follow me there if possible. I worked for the college as a short order cook at their late night grill, and Andy would wait for me to get off work almost every night. He would sit at one of the tables for hours, just waiting for me to finish my shift. It began to creep me out, but I chalked it up to him being an overprotective boyfriend. We did eventually have sex, but I was still not physically attracted to Andy, and I was essentially waiting for him to finish every time we did the deed. He made me feel like it was a necessary part of our relationship, and that, because I slept with my exes, I also needed to sleep with him. Despite this, I did genuinely enjoy his company and our conversations when he wasn't being possessive. We tried being in a relationship for two months, until Christmas break rolled around. When I went home, I had the chance to clear my head and speak to my family about the situation. My mom especially seemed uncomfortable with how frequent Andy contacted me, and it got way worse while we were apart. He got a hold of my family members' Facebook pages and phone numbers, and he would call or message them whenever I didn't immediately answer his calls or texts. It got to the point where he was calling me upwards of ten times a day, and I had hundreds of texts from him. I honestly couldn't afford this relationship anymore. After thinking long and hard about it, I called him up. I told him how I felt, that I thought this relationship wasn't working. I said the cliched phrase, I still want to be friends, and I genuinely meant it. Andy flipped out. He began calling and messaging me even more frequently than before, at all hours of the day and night, swinging wildly from... You broke my heart. Please come back to me. All the way to. How dare you, you stupid bitch. I deserve way better than you. And he'd go back again. I had no clue what to do. I dreaded returning to school. When the day finally came and I went back to campus, Andy sought me out. He would freak out on me for no reason, curse at me and call me names, then apologize profusely. His attitudes would change frequently, sometimes the next day, sometimes even the next hour. He still waited for me outside of work. He still followed me back to my dorm. He still walked with our group of friends to and from class. When they were around, he would pretend to want to be friends, then wait until we were walking alone and start in on me. He would push me or step on the back of my heels while I was walking and mock me. Then when I complained, he would say he was just joking. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was showing all these warning signs, and I was too stupid and naive to pick up on them. I did tell him I thought we needed to spend some time apart, and that worked for a short while. And he eventually seemed to even out, and a few weeks later invited me to his dorm room to play video games with him as a peace offering. When I arrived, he snuck me in the back way so we didn't have to leave the door open. He offered me a drink. This made me nervous, but I was an underage college student, 
so far be it for me to turn down an alcoholic beverage. Everything seemed to be going all right. We were getting along and joking around, so I got more comfortable. I had another drink, and very quickly after this, I started to feel exceedingly tired and had trouble standing. I don't know if he was topping off my drink when I wasn't looking, or if, God forbid, he put something in my drink, but there was no way I was leaving that room that night. And he became very accommodating and arranged for me to crash on his couch. I agreed, but I could tell something wasn't right, so I told him in a drowsy voice while slurring my words that under no uncertain terms was he to try anything sexual that night. He laughed it off, but agreed, and the last thing I remember is curling up on the couch and falling asleep. I don't need to tell you what happened that night while I was passed out. The next morning when I found out, I was horrified. I yelled at Andy, who laughed it off as something funny, that I brought it on myself by drinking. I then left. I went to my dorm room across the campus, crawled into bed, and cried. I skipped classes that day and stayed in my room the whole time. I called out of work. I didn't want to do anything or see anyone. I didn't tell anyone what happened then, and I honestly didn't know that what happened was considered sexual assault until months later. At some point during the afternoon, Andy tried to sneak into my room. I freaked out, yelling at him to get the fuck out. He apologized and told me he just wanted to drop off some things, and he didn't think I'd be there. He had a hot water bottle and flowers. How sweet. Not. He kind of threw them in the room and shut the door as I yelled at him to leave me alone. A couple of months went by, and he still followed me sometimes, but I told him to back off. He still messaged me but I mostly ignored him. He followed me off campus on multiple occasions, and I also learned that he'd been following me around for quite some time. I began to develop anxiety about seeing him everywhere, and I went to the campus doctor. I explained parts of the story to him, and he gave me some Xanax and antidepressants to help with my paranoia. I tried my best to function, but my grades suffered and so did my friendships. By this point, I had maybe three friends left who didn't think I was this horrible person that led Andy on and then dumped him and broke his heart. The icing on the cake for me was when Andy crashed my birthday party. Apparently, he asked one of my friends if he could help plan it, but she didn't know that we weren't speaking, so she agreed. He showed up to the park where it was being held, drank all the alcohol, then began telling my few friends that I still had how much of a bitch I was. He called me a whore. He told them I let him on and broke his heart, and the entire evening was ruined. Unfortunately, he was too drunk to drive himself home, so I was nominated to bring him back by driving his car. I mentioned I didn't want to do this by myself, so a friend offered to ride with me to help carry him into his dorm room, but immediately after that she booked it. She left me alone with him in his dorm room, even though I told her I was extremely uncomfortable being alone with him. She knew some of what happened, but I think she figured I was being dramatic or exaggerating. Immediately after she left, all of a sudden he wasn't that drunk anymore. He immediately turned hostile and threatening. He told me if I didn't stay with him, he would hurt himself, and he pulled out a pair of scissors. He held the blade of his scissors to his wrist, and I took a step back. I was at a loss of what to do in this situation, so I simply stated that he shouldn't hurt himself, but I really wanted to leave. I backed up and slowly went for the door, but he jumped up, dropped the scissors, and grabbed my wrist. He yanked me back from the doorway and twisted my arm behind my back until I cried out. He then threw me against the wall face first, slammed the door shut and locked it. Then he picked me up and tossed me onto his bed. I was terrified, but I told him that if he didn't let me go, I would scream. He covered my mouth with his hand 
and told me if I screamed, I would get into trouble for violating visitation. He said he was going to let me up if I promised to stay in the room with him. I tried to portray that I was calm and relaxed, but inside, I was scared for my life. I thought if I stayed, he would try to assault me again or worse. I agreed to stay with him, and he let me up off of the bed. I sat up, and with all the strength I could muster, I smiled. I said I would be okay hanging out with him, but I really had to use the bathroom. He agreed, but told me not to take too long. He said he'd be waiting outside the door. The dorm bathroom was actually a shared bathroom between two dorm rooms. In Andy's room, there was a door to the right that led to the bathroom. Then if you walked through the bathroom, there was another door on the opposite side that led to another dorm room. Both bathroom doors could be locked from the outside to prevent someone from one dorm using the bathroom to access the other dorm room. I went into the bathroom and closed Andy's door, then prayed the guys who lived in the next dorm room were trusting enough to leave the bathroom door unlocked. I walked to the other side and tried the doorknob. Miraculously, it turned and I opened the door into the room of two very surprised guys. I apologized and mumbled. I just need to get out of there before turning to leave. They both stared incredulously at me as I ran out of their front door. I left that residence hall and ran all the way across campus to my dorm. All of a sudden, I heard footsteps behind me and I heard someone shouting my name. My heart sank. It was Andy. I panicked, but the hall that housed my dorm was directly ahead of me. I picked up the pace and Andy followed suit. He was gaining on me, and it had been ages since I ran. I could see the entrance to my dorm. I had my key out and grabbed the door handle of the first set of doors. There were two sets of doors that led into my residence hall. The first one was always unlocked but the second set you needed a key for. When I got inside the first set of doors, Andy caught up to me and grabbed me by the arm. He tried to use his weight advantage to pull me back away from the second set of doors and out of the entrance. I fought with everything I had, yelling at him to let me go the whole time. I saw through the dorm window that there were people inside the foyer, and if I could just get their attention... I could get one of them to open the door. I finally managed to get close enough to the second set of doors to knock. The instant I knocked on that door, Andy let me go. He walked away quickly, letting a few choice curse words fly in my direction before jogging back in the direction he came. When a guy from inside the foyer opened the door, he saw a girl who was out of breath and on the verge of tears. He asked me if I was okay. I said, I think so, then waved him away. I ran to my dorm room and locked the door immediately. The very next day, I contacted my RA about the situation. I showed her some of the messages Andy sent me and explained that he had broken visitation by coming into my dorm room to drop stuff off for me and that he had just chased me across campus. She was immediately concerned and contacted the Dean of Discipline. They instituted a ban of Andy being allowed to enter my dorm and told him to stay away from me and not to contact me anymore. It took him a long time to even begin to comply. I should have gone to the police, but when I met with the Dean of Discipline, he strongly encouraged me to keep everything in-house. He said, We are a family, and we will deal with this internally, like a family should. I didn't learn this until years later, but this is the attitude of many colleges when dealing with victims of stalking and assault who attend their schools. Eventually, over the next summer, I told my mother most of the details of what happened, and she cried with me. She was extremely supportive and drove me five hours to the police department in the town where my college was located so I could file a report. They basically said since it had been too long since the assault, there wasn't much they could do, but I could try to get a restraining order. 
I followed their directions and was able to get a restraining order against Andy. He violated that order several times, and it ended up going back to court. The court put so many restrictions on him that he ended up having to transfer to another college while I finished my degree. When I graduated, I got out of there and never looked back. I returned to my hometown where I moved back in with my family and got a decent job. I've dealt with anxiety, depression, and extreme paranoia since then, and for a while, I was terrified he would find me again and finish what he started. I got a firearm card and bought a handgun that I keep under my nightstand for protection. I've never had to use it outside of practicing at a range, fortunately. I eventually found a fantastic guy who's amazing, sweet, kind, and very understanding of my past. We're married now, and I've never been happier. I'm so glad I got out of that situation. Many women aren't as lucky. Andy, let's never meet again. Because if you try to hurt me, I'll probably be armed. When I was 16, my friend had told me one of her boyfriends liked me. I asked which one and she said Austin. I said that I would be okay with her giving him my number. She did and a week later, he became my boyfriend. There was nothing out of the ordinary at first. He seemed like a nice guy and I felt like I could trust him. Fast forward to a week later. I was at his house and he wanted to make out with me. I said no because we were in the middle of a video game. He got mad at me and started to have a meltdown. He dragged me upstairs by my hair and I couldn't fight him. Once upstairs, he began to abuse me. I was scared and didn't know what to do. I kept getting abused for a year and a half because I was too scared to leave. Finally, I did, and then I found out some pretty weird stuff about him. I'd heard from a friend of his back from his hometown that he'd planted a bomb in his school and then tried to light himself on fire. Plus, he's been institutionalized more than once. Okay, major red flags, and I wish I would have known a lot sooner. I graduated high school early, at the age of 17, and then moved out of town and started going to college. I had Austin blocked from everything, phone, Facebook, Twitter, basically any social media site. I blocked him if he was on it. Not even a month into college, I kept getting these calls and texts from numbers I didn't know. It was him. I had to constantly block numbers. I was getting tired of it, so I answered one. He was asking me which dorm I lived in because he was on campus and wanted to see me. I threatened to get security and the police if he did not leave. He hung up. I'd gone home that weekend, and then there was a knock on the door. I answer it, and it was him. He was holding a coffee cup and smiling at me. He tried handing me the coffee and told me it was my favorite kind. He was right. It was a regular order at the local coffee shop. I asked him how he knew that, and he confessed that he'd been watching me when I go there. I quickly shut the door and called the police and told him that's what I was doing. He left, but when I went back outside, the coffee cup was next to my car. The thing is, I don't know how he got my address. None of my friends ever gave it to him, and I sure as hell didn't. Fast forward to right before my 18th birthday. I was in the musical at my college, and I'd been advertising it on my Facebook, so friends and family knew when it was. After our Saturday show, I'd gotten a text from an unknown number that said, Thanks for making me laugh. You did really good tonight. From A. I lost it. I showed one of the girls in the show with me, and she got security to walk me back to my dorm. A few weeks later, I found out that he'd bought me birthday presents and wanted me to come get them from his house. I told him no, and he kept bothering me about it. Yet again, 
he ended up showing up at my house when I was home. It was about 11.30 at night, and I heard a tapping noise at the window. I thought it was the wind making a branch hit the window, so I thought nothing of it. Probably about 10 minutes later, I heard whispering outside. I opened my blinds and he was standing there. I froze and shut the blinds. I called the police again, and when I got off the phone, went back to the window and told him the police were coming and that if I ever saw him again, I would get a restraining order. To this day, that was the last time I saw him. I'll start with some brief context. I lived with an abusive male partner who didn't value my safety whatsoever. He got really mad if I didn't leave the door unlocked, and we lived in a not-so-great part of town. He was way older than me. I was barely 18 at the time, and he was 26. Neither of us owned a car. He worked at Waffle House, and I was getting sick constantly, so keeping a job wasn't easy for me. He liked drugs and alcohol and he traumatized me in regards to both. He blamed me for his usage and would assault me while he was on it. Fun fact, he said if I reported his conduct, he would blame me because he was the one on the substance, even though he held me down and forced it, not me. I digress. When I finally got the courage to leave him, for the last time, I did it while he was at work. I begged my mother to get me necessities, Instead, she called the cops. There was a warrant for his arrest, and she got a police escort just in case. As soon as he got out, he immediately started messaging me from a different, new number, threatening to murder me and my family if I didn't go home with him. It didn't matter if I blocked him. There would be a new number, and he would keep at it. I was scared, but I thought for the most part I was safe. After all, he didn't have a car. I was wrong. About a week into this, he and his gun-owning friend showed up. He banged on the door and was screaming. His friend owning a gun is important because he repeatedly said that he and his friend would shoot us. My window was on the second floor facing the street and my stomach dropped when he saw me. I immediately dropped and army crawled to my little brother's room and hid in the closet. His window faced the backyard, and I guess my monkey brain felt safer there. I was the only one home, and scared that if I breathed too loud, he'd hear me. I was terrified. I didn't want to call the police, because my dumb ass thought he'd hear that too. I silently texted my mom. Police arrived about 20 minutes after my mom said they were on their way. He and his friend were taken into custody after the same friend had gotten him out on bond. His friend did have a gun, but he didn't. Bottom line, I was able to get a restraining order, and I'm strictly sober, and definitely in therapy after that. My memory of this story is not perfectly chronological, and in all honesty, at the time the truth came to light for most of us, a lot of stories converged, causing some cloudiness. This was over the span of at least six months. When I was ending my senior year of high school, ready to transition into my freshman year of college, I was added into a group message on Facebook with a bunch of other incoming freshmen by my roommate. Her name was Fran. We'd met through the Facebook page for our school and ended up living together all four years. She rocks. Anyway, I believe there are about ten or so of us in this group chat and we talked all day every day, leading up to our arrival on campus. We'd gotten really close over the summer and had hung out in smaller groups quite a few times already. The day we arrived on campus, everyone scurried to their rooms to unpack. My roommate and I were setting up our room with the door open when the mother of one of our neighbors popped by to greet us. 
We went over to their room to meet them, and their mother introduced us to her daughter, Sam, and her roommate, Nancy. Both of them were nice girls, and we talked for a bit before going back to our room to continue unpacking. We invited them to come with us to the welcome party later that night. When the time came, we were all organizing to meet up for the campus welcome party in our Facebook group. We had added our two neighbors to the group chat after telling everyone we invited them. We agreed on a time and all met up down there. It was a lot of fun for everyone, and we continued to regularly hang out following that day. As time passed, smaller groups of people from the large chat began to get closer and closer. Fran and I became quite close with our neighbors, since their room was near ours. We usually kept the door to our room open, as it was a common hangout spot for all the people from our group. We just asked that they would knock if it was closed, but that otherwise everyone was always welcome. One day we were all hanging out, talking about high school, and Nancy tells us that she never went to a prom because she was bullied and everyone at her school hated her. We all felt so terrible and apologized that this had happened to her. We assured her that prom really wasn't that fun anyway. She seemed to appreciate that. We noticed following this that Nancy was an open book and would often tend to share personal information without really being prompted. However, I don't think anyone minded. It was a weird time for everyone, and maybe this was her way of bonding with others. I remember also that she had a very dark sense of humor, and would often make strange jokes alluding to things like violence. Strange as it was, again, we brushed it off as though she was just struggling to connect and awkwardly overcompensating. As time goes by, she continues to disclose intense personal details. She ended up disclosing experiences such as sexual assault and abuse, things that people in our group who'd gone through similar things really connected with her on. One night I was at a chain diner with Nancy and another friend from the group chat. In a moment of silence as we ate our food, Nancy blurts out, I used to have an eating disorder, you know. Too stunned to think of an empathetic response, both of us just kind of raised our eyebrows and said, Wow, this sounds like a pretty cold reaction, I understand, but please know at this point, there was something new every time we hung out with her. It was hard to keep saying something meaningful, especially when it was so often out of nowhere. It was overwhelming so most of us began to distance ourselves from her. My roommate and I started keeping our door closed most of the time, just so we could at least get warning when someone was going to come in. However, Nancy didn't respect this request. She would often just swing the door open and come in. So, one night, we decided we would start locking our door to help reinforce the knock-first policy. We were sitting in our desks doing our homework, when we hear someone turn the knob and push. Of course, being that it was locked, the door didn't open. The person aggressively jiggled the doorknob before finally knocking. I remember looking up at my roommate creeped out and being met by her wide-eyed stare back. We open the door, and lo and behold, Nancy cometh. She asked about the locked door, quite jarred by this matter, and we explained our reasoning. She stayed and hung out a while, and we talked. She looked at Fran's prom photo on the wall and told us how she was prom queen at her school and how she was so popular and loved by everyone. How awesome, we thought. We asked to see pictures of her dress and she showed us. We told her how beautiful it was and how she looked so nice. A bit later, we said our goodnights and she left. As we spent less time with her, the stories became more and more intense. She was being stalked and she showed us photos of her walking down campus, taken by someone else. We saw text after text from this person to her, threatening her and berating her. We were scared for her and would make sure to accompany her wherever she went. At the same time, she began to experience fainting spells. She refused to take them seriously. We would see her just randomly fall onto her bed occasionally, 
but most of the time she would just report them to us. She told us it happened in the shower many times. Her roommate, Sam, being a concerned and caring human, reached out to Nancy's parents. They got her in to see a doctor, and she returned to school with a heart monitor, which was somewhat shocking to us given that she told us her family was neglectful and abusive. Maybe they just got involved since Sam had called to keep up a good front. During the time she'd had this monitor, not a single episode occurred. As soon as it was gone, again she fainted. Interesting. We were not in the business of questioning anyone's health or looking to accuse someone of dishonesty, so we simply continued to distance ourselves. Eventually, we began to speculate and pieces of the puzzle fell into place. The first thing we realized was that the prom stories did not match up. She told us that she was hated and bullied, but she also told us she was prom queen, and we saw pictures of her dress and her at prom. Why would she lie about that? At this point, we assumed she was probably just lying about small details in her life to control the way we viewed her. Fran and I continued to figure things out that didn't add up. She told us she was assaulted by a family member in her youth, and he was in prison for it. So, being young women adept at Facebook creeping, we got to researching. For a few hours, we combed through Facebook pages, tracked down the names of all family members, looked up criminal records and databases, and never found a single thing besides a speeding ticket. Now this was starting to get weird. Why would someone lie about things like that, especially after other friends had genuinely been through similar circumstances? Not cool. Fran and I were sure that we were being lied to constantly at this point, but we had no idea what to do about it. We are both far from confrontational, so we thought to have a meeting of the minds instead. We invited two people from our group chat, who we believed to be the most level-headed, over to our dorm in the hopes that we were just anxiously hyping each other up and that they would bring us back down to earth. We whispered our thoughts to them as we didn't want her to pass by and suddenly hear us. I'm sure we were making a bigger deal out of it than it was necessary, but it was so eerie. They actually agreed with us and we decided we were officially not going to be friends with her anymore. Honestly, at this point, we barely were anyway. She stopped getting invited to group hangouts, and I think she began to get the hint. Sam was still friends with us, so there was definitely a lot of tension between them. One day, Sam noticed Nancy on a Twitter account that didn't look like her personal one. She searched the name up from her phone and found an anonymous Twitter account filled with tweets about how much this person hated their roommates, their old friends, how they had something coming for them. I can't remember if it had been in person or on the account, but I'm certain that there was a general mention of access to weapons somewhere. Sam confronted Nancy about the account, and Nancy said she knew nothing about it. Sam asked to see her iPad, and Nancy handed it over, where Sam saw the account logged in. Nancy explained that she'd given her sign-in information to a friend to rant about their living situation and told Sam that the friend would text her to confirm. A few minutes later, Sam received a text from the friend admitting that. They talked it out to make sure it was true, and Sam apologized to Nancy for misunderstanding. After discussing this with my dear friend and ex-roommate, Fran, I realized there are numerous other strange lies and encounters that I desperately want to include because they enrich the story but can't feasibly be put into writing. 1. She told us she was straight edge and never drank when we first got to campus. She would not drink with us. A long while later, in conversation, she mentioned that she drank a lot of alcohol in high school, so much so that she had brought a water bottle full of vodka to a volleyball practice and gotten intoxicated there. Number 2. Like I said, she alleged that she had a stalker, and would often send us screenshots of their texts, but she refused to show us them on our phone and always blocked out the phone number in the screenshots. 
She told us she didn't want us to call and harass this person. Number three, one time during the fainting spells, Fran complimented a shirt Nancy was wearing and Nancy responded, thanks, my mom said if I faint again, she's going to return it. And that really shows how she would just spurt out very serious things casually. Number four, as shown by the door locking incident, she had a really bad read on personal space. Once, when I was away at home, Fran had a really bad migraine and Nancy came over to check on her throughout the evening. She would stand over Fran as she was resting and insisted on calling her Princess. Sam said she'd woken up in the middle of the night to Nancy sitting up in bed staring at her. Number five, she came back from being home over one weekend and told us that her parents took all the money out of her bank account and pushed her down an entire flight of stairs. She did not have a single visible scratch, bruise, or bump on her. That's not to discredit, it's just a note. And number six, we're pretty sure she would pretend to be on the phone arguing with family because she was doing so once, and we could hear no one talking or yelling back on the other line. Moments later, she received a call, and we could hear someone loud and clear responding back. One of our friends was a commuter student and invited a bunch of us over to his house for a bonfire, luckily without Nancy. We were all sitting outside in the dark by the warmth and light of the fire. Given that bonfires pair pretty well with a spooky tale, Fran and I decided it was time to bring out our hypothesis on Nancy's dishonesty to the whole group. At this time, we figured she'd been dishonest about the prom story and the fainting, we still believed everything else otherwise, warily. Everyone began to admit that they thought it all seemed untrue, and we all began to piece more lies together out loud. I remember the intensity of it all. We felt like investigators, like a detective on a case, finally finding that last piece of evidence. For a long time, we all got really energized and were on a passionate group tirade about the whole situation. The energy died down a bit, and finally Sam got everyone's attention. When I was on her iPad, I saw a free texting app. What if all those texts were fake too? The stalker, the friend. Silence. It was absolutely silent. We should call it, I said. Those numbers don't work for phone calls. So one of the girls pulled up her phone and entered the number of Nancy's friends from Sam's texts. We sat in silence as she pressed the call button. It was a dead line. The hair on my neck stood up. The whole lot of us sat there, entirely aghast. I think being outside in the dark certainly intensified this, but we were honestly horrified. We realized that the Twitter was her, and she was making those tweets about us about Sam, and she mentioned weapons. We tiptoed back into our dorm that night, and Sam slept at her boyfriend's. Sam, Fran, and I decided we needed to share this information with our RA, just in case. We concocted up a rather ridiculous plan on how we would get there without Nancy noticing. We asked to meet the RA in the downstairs office, rather than one of our rooms. Then, and this is the ridiculous part. We each went down a separate staircase. Highly unnecessary and hilarious to me in hindsight, but I think it highlights just how scared we really were at the time. We disclosed most of the information to the RA that pertained to us being in danger, but nothing about abuse or assault. In the event that those things held any truth, it wasn't ours to share. And that's kind of where it ends for now and hopefully forever. I can't quite remember much detail after that night, and I don't think the RA did much more than just talk to her, but I'm not sure. She got a new roommate and moved out. I know she befriended some new people and they stayed friends, as far as I know, until we all graduated. In all, I don't know if she was ever truly a threat to us. I somewhat still believe much of this was a strange and unacceptable way to try and connect to others. 
There's a piece of advice that my roommate's awesome mom shared in all of this, and a warning I heed to others. If something seems too good or bad to be true, it probably is. Regardless, for my own well-being, I have kept my space from Nancy and intend to indefinitely. This happened when I was a student and my girlfriend was working. We had just started dating, but I went over to her place often. I was practically living there. She told me about some guy she dated before she met me. She said he constantly calls her, shows up at her apartment, and sometimes wait for her outside her door so he can speak to her. Do you want me to talk to this guy? I asked. No, he's not going to do anything. Don't worry, she replied. I don't care, but if you don't want me to speak to the guy, then why don't you call the police on him for harassment? I questioned. I'm the one who broke up with him. In a way, this is kind of my fault, she said. I couldn't convince her to report it. He didn't seem like that much of a threat either. During the summer holiday, my girlfriend went back to her hometown to visit her parents. She said I could stay in her room if I wanted. I liked the idea of having the place to myself for a while. I already had plans to set up my console on her big screen TV and enjoy an endless gaming session. The day after she left was her birthday. I was a little bummed that we weren't spending it together, but it was early in our relationship. So that night, as soon as it hit midnight, I decided that I would at least send a happy birthday text and get straight back to gaming. The room was really hot. I turned on the aircon. The only light source in the room was the TV. I was really into the game. I barely noticed the doorbell. I took a quick glance at my watch and it was 11.30. Who the hell would call it this time, I thought. It wasn't my apartment, so I decided to ignore it. The doorbell kept on ringing. What was wrong with this person? Common sense dictates that if someone doesn't answer at this hour, then they're out or not going to answer. It was unending. Then the thumping on the door began. Hey, Sowry, I know you're in there. It's me, her ex. He's probably turned up to wish her happy birthday. I didn't want to give him any indication that I was in her apartment. I didn't know how he would react. I hit pause on my game and waited for this guy to give up and go home, keeping my eyes on the door just in case. It got to just before midnight, and I heard footsteps heading down the hall. Finally he gave up, I thought. I thought that was the end of it, so I pulled out my phone and began composing a text to my girlfriend. Then I heard some weird squeaking kind of sound coming from by the window. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Was this guy scaling the building? I turned off the TV and got down on the floor behind the bed. A huge shadow emerged on the balcony behind the curtain, and the person began to bang on the window. The silhouette then wandered around, perhaps looking for a gap in the curtains to look into. I know you're in there. Open the door, he called out. How? How does he know I'm in here? I asked myself. The aircon. The unit is outside. He must be able to tell it's still on. He kept hammering on the balcony window and calling out to me. I was really freaked out. This guy was hellbent on getting in. He kept this up for another 10 to 15 minutes, and then I heard that squeaking sound again. It sounded like he was climbing back down the balcony via the drain pipe. The apartment fell silent. After a while, I crept over to the door and put my eye against the people. My heart stopped. I saw him pressed with his ear against the door. He was listening for movement. I couldn't move. I didn't want to make a sound. I kept my eye fixed on him. He crouched down. What are you up to? I wondered. With a snap, the mail slot flew open. Thankfully it was hooded so he couldn't look up to me. 
I leaned one of my legs back against the wall so it would be out of sight. His hand emerged through the slot and started grasping around. What are you doing? I wondered as I stared at his hand. He moved his hand skillfully like this wasn't the first time he had done this. In his hand, he held a weird carpentry tool. I think it's called a set square. It was slowly moving up towards the lock. The tool clattered against the lock. It made me shiver. I didn't know what to do. It's only a matter of time until I get in there, he muttered as he strained to reach the lock. I had to think. What should I do? My mind was racing. Do I call the cops? How long would the police take to get here? Wouldn't he hear me on the phone to them? What do I tell the police when they get here? It's not my apartment. What would my girlfriend think if I called the cops to her place? Should I fight this guy? Surely he will get angry when he finds out I'm in his ex's apartment. What if he flies into a blind range? Should I get a weapon? A knife? Could I actually stab someone if I had to? I was panicking. I was no closer to coming up with a strategy. While I was there thinking, the tool was getting closer to the lock. It was time to make a decision. I kicked his arm holding the tool as hard as I could and simultaneously threw the chain on the lock. The arm quickly retracted through the mail slot. Things were calm again. Bang. That terrible sound echoed through the apartment. He was trying to kick the door in. My girlfriend's apartment wasn't exactly Fort Knox. It was a pretty old building, to be honest. Judging by the size of him, he could get that door down. I could see the door shaking with each kick. I heard other doors open and muttering voices. Did some of the other residences come out to see what was going on? I looked through the peephole and saw him run off down the hall. He made so much noise. Surely everyone's reported it. He must be thinking that too. He won't be back. At least not tonight. That night, sleep didn't come. When my girlfriend returned, I explained everything and asked her to please move as soon as possible. I dread to think what might have happened if she was home alone that night and not me. Thankfully she did move and I moved with her. She changed her number so that creep couldn't get in touch with her anymore. We live in a new town now, pretty far away. What freaks me out though is that this guy was hellbent on getting in. I have no choice but to assume he's still hellbent on finding her. Who knows, I may have even passed him in the street. This happened about five years ago. I was in my second year of college at the time. I was single and looking for a woman, so I figured I'd download a dating app. After a fair few swipes, I managed to get a match. I couldn't believe my luck. She was really hot. She was slender, but with unreal curves. Pretty much my dream girl. She was straight in with the messages and straight to the point. It seemed like we were both looking for the same thing so a meetup was set up quickly. We met at a hotel room and it became a regular thing. I always picked up the bill. Luckily for me, I had a part-time job during my studies. I wasn't made of money though, and sometimes it was really tough because I didn't have that much cash. One time she contacted me just before payday and I had to turn her down. So she asked me to go to her parents' house. I wasn't ready to meet the parents yet, and as far as I knew, it wasn't that kind of relationship, if you know what I mean. But she messaged me, asking me to sneak in at around 9pm and no one will know I'm there. She lived a little far away and I was more than a little skeptical. I hesitated for a while, but the memories of what we got up to in that hotel room persuaded me. She gave me her address and it was about 10 minutes from a train station. I found the house and it looked clean and pretty ordinary. I wasn't picking up any bad vibes from the outside. I wasn't overly happy about sneaking in though. The house did look kind of deserted, but so did a few of the houses in the area. 
It was in the middle of nowhere, the backwards of Saitama. I had to climb a little to get into a room. It was kind of like a scene from a movie. I got into her bedroom easy enough, though. Her room was covered in pink wallpaper, and there were stuffed animals on the shelf. I could tell that she'd grown up in this room. My parents are sleeping in the next room. Don't talk much, okay? My parents will wake up at 7am. Just make sure you're out before then, she whispered to me. Then we got down to it. It was great. It was heightened by that feeling of being caught. After, I went to have my usual smoke. I didn't really have the energy to climb back down, and plus it seemed a little risky, so I popped the window open. I could tell she didn't really like this idea. She really hated smoking, so I blew the smoke directly out of the window. Then I heard someone say, I'll kill you. It was a high-pitched female voice, either coming from the hall or the room next to us. What followed was footfall. Someone was coming to her room. She looked me in the eyes and said, Hide quickly. You'll be killed. She was on the verge of tears. I could tell that the threat I just heard was more than likely credible. Panic gripped my heart. The closet seemed to be the only available place that I could hide. The second I silently closed the closet door, I heard the door to the bedroom be thrown open. I stood there, shaking with fear in just my underwear. Her mother was now in the bedroom, and she sounded pissed. Did you smoke? She asked her daughter. So what if I did? She replied. You know you have to be 21 to smoke. What are you doing? You know your dad hates it too. I won't smoke again. Just get out she said to her mom. I am paraphrasing, but that was the gist of it. She was protecting me, and I was grateful. I felt as if I would get away with it. That was until I made one fatal error. I shifted my feet and slipped slightly, causing the back of my head to lightly bang against the wall. The mother-daughter argument stopped abruptly. Who's in there? Her mom asked. I heard the door open to the bedroom briefly. I thought the mom had left out of embarrassment, but just as quickly as those footsteps left, they returned and they approached the closet. I tried to hold the door shut with all my strength, but one tough pull from her mom threw the closet doors open. Who are you? She asked while glaring at me. I was up the creek without a paddle. She looked me up and down. The front of my grey underwear had begun to change colour with the tension. If you don't leave now, you'll die for real. I looked down and noticed she was holding a hammer. Not a standard household hammer, but more like a mallet. It looked like the edge of a sledgehammer. I got the hell out of there as quickly as possible. I didn't need to be asked twice. That look on her face told me that she was stone cold serious. I ran back to the train station while simultaneously getting dressed. Because of the time I left, I would only get about halfway home, so I spent the night in some weird train station. Later, I sent an apology message. The response I received made me realize how close a call I just had. That's okay, don't worry. I'm just really glad my dad didn't wake up. He's in a gang. Every time he meets a boyfriend, he scares them off. He once took one for a drive and I didn't see him again. I hope he doesn't find you. So when her mom said, If you don't leave now, you'll die. She wasn't just trying to scare me. She was trying to warn me of her gangster husband. A part of my mind prayed for it to be a joke because I'm pretty sure I told her where I lived. She seemed a little sketchy now. It seemed to me she was enjoying the scare I had. She sent that email, and then I heard nothing more from her. I got off the apps and didn't meet anyone in places I haven't been before, and I told people where I was going when I did meet someone new. I'm taking life a little more seriously these days. A while back, the guy I was dating had his car broken into, 
Someone stole his wallet. It had his driver's license and all of his cards in there. He filed a police report, but the officer said that there'd been a number of reported thefts in the area at the time. There was no investigation. Nothing could be done about it. About six months after the break-in, I got a call from someone claiming to be a police officer. He told me that a large number of wallets and purses had been found in a trash can at a rest area just off of the National Highway. He said that my boyfriend's wallet was one of the ones they recovered. The policeman said that he'd been trying to contact my boyfriend. He said he called the number on his driver's license, but he was unable to reach him. I mean, he did change numbers at one point in those six months that passed. He said that he found my business card in the wallet and a photo of me. My boyfriend carried around a photo I had done for my passport. I hated it, but he liked it for some reason. Also, my business card has my company photo on it, so for the officer, I guess it was natural to try the number on my business card. The officer said that he would meet me someplace to deliver the wallet. He said that the wallet was being held in a police station, which was a couple of hours' drive from my town. He said that he would meet me in a coffee shop just on the outskirts of town. I knew the place. It wasn't an impressive coffee shop. It was kind of run down, to be honest. So this officer was happy to go out of his way to deliver the wallet to me at a coffee shop, but not at the local police station. That seemed a little weird. Why would he not deliver it to my boyfriend? I told him that I was happy to get the wallet from the police station if he dropped it off there. It felt wrong so I told him I wasn't going to meet him at the coffee shop, and with that, I hung up. I called the police station the officer said the wallet was being held in to see if I could make arrangements to come and collect it. They confirmed that the wallet had been found in the trash can with many others at the rest area. I asked why an officer was calling to meet me at a coffee shop. The officer I was speaking to was taken aback. He said that it would be impossible for an officer to make an exchange like that, he said only the owner of the wallet would be allowed to collect it. This was very different to what the officer said to me. I immediately thought to myself, what would have happened if I went to that isolated coffee shop by myself? That thought sent chills racing through my body. I guess that either the police officer was doing something completely against the rules by offering to meet me, or the thief was the one trying to arrange a meeting. It was a really weird experience, and one that really frightens me when I think back to it. I'm glad I took a second to think before I acted. Who knows what the man on the other end of the line had in store for me. I had a childhood friend who ruined my life. He turned my life into a living nightmare. I'm just going to call him R. We met at elementary school, and we got on straight from the get-go. We ended up going to the same middle school and high school. It was great because we both got along very well. We used to walk home together, and sometimes we went to school together in the mornings. My parents didn't even complain when I had him over. We weren't dating or anything like that. But I guess that it could have looked like we were. I didn't see many other girl-boy-friend combos at my school. He was, to me, a very good friend. Because he was such a good friend, I told him when I entered into a relationship with another boy. I was nervous of telling him. I was thinking, will he make fun of me or will he support me? How's this one going to play out? I told him, and initially, he didn't react much. But later that day, at lunch, he punched through a window. I felt awful but I didn't know if he did that entirely because of me. It was after that point that R's behavior began to drastically change. He became very clingy and needy. He would stick by my side every break that we had between classes. He would wait for me in the morning and after school and every night he wanted to come to my house. It wasn't just in person though. He was bombarding me with emails, texts and calls every single night. If I didn't reply, he would send even more. I'm older now, and I can see how naive I was being every time I replied to him. I should have just cut ties, but that's hindsight for you. I shouldn't have given him the oxygen he needed to continue. Things started to get 
pretty creepy when I would wake up and see him right outside our house. Like literally, when I woke up in the morning, I'm talking before 7am, I took the advice of some of my female friends and I confronted him one morning. I said to him, Hey, you know, I said I had a boyfriend, right? So maybe we should keep a little distance between us. The second I said that to him, he flipped out. Why? I'm the one who's been with you this entire time. I understand you way more than he does, and I appreciate you more than he does. So why him and why not me? He turned to try and put his arms around me, but I saw it coming in the nick of time. After that, he would appear whenever my boyfriend and I went out on dates, and sometimes it felt as if he would try to sabotage them. Whenever my boyfriend would come over, he would turn up at my house and start ringing the doorbell. I didn't know how to deal with someone like that at that age. He was relentless. I swear one time when my parents were out, it was just me and my boyfriend, R tried to break in. I heard several thuds and bangs coming from the front door. R would do other things too. He started spreading lies, specifically ones about my boyfriend at school. It seemed like he was hell-bent on breaking up our relationship. Things went downhill for R. He stopped going to school so much when he realized that he wasn't going to break us up. Apparently, he gave up on going to college too. He still harassed me though, only digitally. I quickly learned to block all unusual friend requests and weird emails. I heard a rumor before I left my hometown for college that he wound up in a mental asylum. I can't put much faith in that rumor though. I hope that isn't the case because even though he turned into a crazed stalker of a friend, he was still at one point my best friend. After graduation, I rented an apartment with the boyfriend I made at school and I still live with him. I really don't know what happened to R, but I often think to myself, he's out there. He's still out there. I try not to share too much personal information online because he was bad as a teenager. He could be worse as an adult. For a little bit of background, I'm in a wonderful relationship now with a guy I met on Tinder, so this is in no way, shape, or form me shitting on the app. I'm currently a senior at a four-year university, but this happened in my sophomore year when I was 19. For me, it was pretty hard to find someone to just casually date and get to know, since I'm a bit of an introverted individual and wasn't looking for any old hump and dump. I also went through my fair share of abusive relationships, so dating for me was really difficult when it came to opening up and trusting people. When I matched with Chris, I was pleasantly surprised. He was a funny, smart, interesting college student with a decent job and good intentions. I enjoyed talking to him, but there was a lot of anxiety when I spoke with him. I know now that I should have trusted my gut instinct, but at the time, I assumed I was doing my introverted trust issues bullshit and tried to push that feeling away. We would talk a few times a week, and every time we did, the feeling would persist. Only each time we talked, it would be stronger. He started to make comments about how he wanted me to be his girlfriend and how he was so excited for me to meet his parents. But we hadn't met, and it only talked on and off for a few weeks at this point. So, slowly, I stopped responding to some of his messages, and I started to leave them completely unanswered. One day, I confided in my friends and told them about the bad feeling I always had while talking with Chris. They told me that I wasn't being open to new experiences because I hadn't let go of my past and that I wasn't being fair to him. So, reluctantly... After a few weeks of radio silence and feeling guilty, I messaged him again. Another week or two of messaging and catching up, he asked me to go out to dinner with him. I was hesitant to say yes, as my anxiety was through the roof, but my friends insisted that it was just nerves and it would be good for me to go out with someone. I agreed, and he excitedly told me he had plans to take me to a nice Japanese restaurant in the city next to my campus. My friends were ecstatic and asked to see a picture of him. 
I pulled up his Tinder profile, and when they swiped through the pictures, they were silent. You know, he, uh, he kind of looks like Jacob. Jacob was a particularly abusive ex. I went into a full-blown panic attack. Once I saw the resemblance, there was no going back. There was no way I was going anywhere with this guy. I texted him back the night before the date and explained that I no longer felt comfortable going out and that I was sorry. He never texted me back. That same week, I started getting multiple phone calls every day from an unknown number. They would leave me voicemails that would say things like, Call me back, babe. Or, Baby, where are you? Why won't you give me a chance? I tried ignoring them, but one day, after getting almost ten calls, I answered, ready to curse someone the fuck out. I called Chris by his name and told him where to go and was met with laughter. This isn't Chris. This is Jeff. Who? Chris said I could have you. <laughs> he started laughing. So I hung up and he immediately called me back. I sent him to voicemail. He said you wanted to go out with me instead. He told me what university you go to and showed me your pictures. I'll wait on campus if I have to. I blocked his number and for a few more days, I got a few more unknown calls and voicemails detailing some pretty weird, aggressive, and gross stuff but they eventually died down. I don't know if this guy was serious, or maybe it was Chris getting his friend to mess with me as revenge for cancelling, but whatever it was, it had me looking behind myself any time I walked anywhere on campus for the rest of the semester. My roommates and I had a male friend stay with us for a while, just in case. I started going back to my hometown on the weekends because I was afraid to stay on campus for too long. It's been two years, so I hope that in this amount of time, Chris and Jeff have learned to become better people. Or that someone kicked their asses already. For a bit of backstory, I was working at a small chain motel in the Midwest as a night auditor. My hours were normally 11pm to 8am. With those kinds of hours and being a woman, I'm bound to have some weird stories. The scariest time I've ever had working there happened within my first month. So, it was a little before my shift started, and because I was single and 22, I was on Tinder before work. I match with this guy who seems cool, a little goth and alternative, and into Ouija boards and tarot, which is my type, so I was hyped at the time. We talk for a bit, and I tell him I have to go to work. We say goodbye. Now, that night was my first night off training, so I was running the motel by myself for nine hours. I was already a little nervous. But then, this vaguely familiar guy comes up to the front desk and asks for me by name. In my head, I've got red flags blaring at me because this guy is weird. Not by looks, but just by the vibe. I tell him yes, that's me, and he explained that he was the guy from Tinder, and he saw that I was less than a mile away, so he went out to see if I was possibly working at this hotel. That's right. This guy was staying where I worked. Red flag number two. I stay behind the comfort of my desk for two hours because this guy won't stop talking to me. Mostly about how his ex left him and how he beat people up and how he wanted to bang me. Needless to say, I was uncomfortable and this hadn't happened to me before in a work environment. So I did not know what to do. He finally decided to go to bed at 2 to 3 in the morning, and I take a much-needed smoke break. I go outside, and right after I spark up, guess who shows up? The creepy guy. I snooped a bit on his account. He was a painter and was doing work locally, 
So he wasn't from here. He tells me about where he's from and keeps getting closer and closer to me. He asks me if he can smoke weed, which I said yes so he'd get away from me. I showed him where the cameras weren't and he pulled me in, smelled my neck, and started to grab my ass. I swiftly hit him and told him he better not touch me again. I threw my cigarettes on the ground and grab my phone to call my boss before going inside. The creepy guy rips the phone from my hand and proceeds to text himself. Now he had my number. First thing he sends me is a grotesque picture of his extremely body-modded nether region. I've seen some of those in my day, but that was like nothing I'd ever seen. Then came the creepy BDSM adult images with captions like, I can't wait to do this to you. You know what room I'm in. Now I'm already freaking out, and I don't know why I didn't call the cops. And my boss wasn't answering. So there's me in the back office, having the panic attack of my life, when I get one more video. Why I clicked on it, I'll never know. I refuse to say what I saw in detail, but it was a snuff adult video. Very violent very sexual. I then locked myself in the back room, cried, and waited a few hours before proceeding to make hotel breakfast. The text went on for a few days, until I'd had enough. I got the balls to tell my boss. He immediately kicked out the creepy guy and banned him from our hotel. His company is not even allowed to book with that hotel anymore. In hindsight, I should have called the police, but I was too scared. This was in April 2021. For a bit of background, my name is Janelle. I'm a 21-year-old French girl. I'm a student in Lille. I was tired that I was not finding true love so I decided to have my first time with my best friend. Then I find a fantastic sex friend, which I get along with wonderfully on all levels. We were together for about three months. They then sound the time to throw me away, because I still love my ex. I was very fragile that I made my first attempt to end it all. I end up being taken to emergency and in the mental hospital. For those of you that have already deduced, you'll understand that I was already in a depressive state for a few months, with a strong punch shot for alcohol. To complete this auto-destructive mechanism, what better than dating apps? A few weeks after my release from the mental hospital, I match up to make new encounters and especially forget my dear and tender sex friend. I always meet the guys at home for a first date, because I have zero experience, and that's what I did for my very first date. One fine day comes when I matched with a guy, Matthew. Matthew is not very beautiful and has a few extra pounds, but I'm no Beyonce either, so I match. We laugh a little, we have some common tastes, and especially he smokes weed, so I thought, it's perfect, we'll smoke some joints between us. He gives me some personal information, like his address, and his job, or rather old job. He'd just gotten fired. Work or no work, I don't care. I don't want to share my life with him anyway. I explain to him that I'm fragile and that I've come out of a mental clinic, that I'm depressed and blah blah blah. It was all for the sole purpose of making him understand that he can't play with me. I also tell him that I'm solely looking for sex but still with some discussion, complicity, hugs, and other things of that nature. I explain that I'm not just a shot in 20 minutes and it's done. He assures me that that's what he's looking for too, and that he's actually very cuddly. Perfect. After only one or two days of talking, we agree on a date. Mojito party at my house, and he brings some joints. And here's how the meeting went. Matthew arrives, he's really not cute, even worse than in the photos. He has a dirty look, like greasy hair, a stained t-shirt, 
the style of a grungy teenager despite him being 26 years old. In short, I mean far from wetting my panties, but I desperately need company. I offer for him to make the drinks while I chose a film on television. He goes into the kitchen and prepares to make two mojitos before joining me on the sofa. We talk a bit. He's not very smart or very interesting. I drown in my drink, hoping to animate the party alone. And this is the start of a three-day blackout. According to our dear Matthew, we would have then drunk and smoked while watching a film before going into the bedroom. I vaguely remember being naked on my bed and seeing him dressed above me, looking at me before turning his heels and slamming the door. My phone is dead. My alarm clock is not ringing. I'm away from a work group appointment, so my friends are worried and call me. They can't contact me, so they contact my sister, but when she tries to get a hold of me, it goes straight to voicemail. The girls come down to my place and ring and ring again, but still no answer. They call the fire service, who manage to get the entry door open, but not the door to my apartment. They knock on the door, calling me, and I end up opening the door, dressed in a blanket to hide my nakedness. I look at them, confused. The firemen conclude that I'm hungover, and they leave while my friends help me get dressed. They also think I drank too much. They notice my body is covered with yellow betadine on my arms, legs, and stomach. I told them that I burned my arm yesterday, and that I treated myself but there were no signs of a burn or anything on my arm. Besides, I don't even own Betadine. My friends take my cat, and I end up at one of their houses, being as I'm in a comatose state. I have trouble speaking. I look completely elsewhere. I even have trouble thinking. The next day my sister comes to pick me up so I can stay with her for a few days. Everyone is convinced I try to end myself again with drugs and alcohol. I start complaining about pain in my intimate area and blood loss, so my sister decides to take me to the hospital. I tell them that I might want to make a report since I was unconscious and it may have been unprotected. I get so many tests. I'm advised to file a complaint and I'm being redirected to the OB emergency. The next day, I finally regain consciousness gently. My relatives see it right away. I'm a little more lively and more coherent. I end up getting more swabs done and I get preventative AIDS treatment. Over the course of a week, I made a series of appointments for blood samples, urine samples, and that stuff. I went to file a complaint with the testimony of my friends who met me at my home and my sister who took care of me. After talking about it to people my age, older people, but especially medical staff and the police, the term organ trafficking was more than mentioned. They think the guy chickened out at the last minute. Despite my complaint, my bed full of betadine, my underwear torn off, and the blood on the doors of the apartment, my attacker got nothing. I will never know what really happened and what he really wanted. I would like to point out that I used to drink and smoke in addition to my treatment, and that never before have I had a blackout of three days. I'm pretty sure he put something in my drink. It's good to talk about it anyway. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that, guys. I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, 
Joy. Handout. Pegasus Genesis. Karen Keating. V. Berry. LJ. Fiona X. Fox. Scott. I Like Booty. Monica Level Ace. Chris and Donna. Holly Spry. Kimber. Jasmine. Sanatix. Heather Haven. Kitty Cat Luna 2. ADHD Aurora. Janice. Cinderella Baby. Borderline Betty. Lady Dracard. Erica Nicole. Snowball Rathena. Melanie. The Honeybee 987. Pretty Girl 215. Ryan. Brooke. Wendy. Crafty Kel. Tina. Dina. Vampy Debs. Patricia. Amber. Krista. Brenda. Absinthe Alice. Christy. Kay. Spider's Web. Ooh La La Andrea. Sue. Monique. Sean Gorman. Emma Lisa. Sigma Cube X. Greg. Chelsea. Amanda Jane. Sam. Zeb Tepe. Sarah C. Austin. Tegan. Lil Smart. Jenny. Gabrielle. Fire 05. Sarah P. James Gargano. Gemma Allen. Monica Level Ace. And Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.